there are a number of conditions that present with non-specific symptoms and typically hemochromatosis would present with lethargy, uh, some joint pains perhaps, um, loss of libido is fairly common um, and then if it's more advanced there are other symptoms as well relating to uh, iron overload. And I guess tiredness is one of those non-specific symptoms like headache and nausea that a lot of patients present with. Um, often we can't find a reason for it. Uh, but certainly the sort of things you might think of, or we might think of as GPs, are things like um, hypothyroidism, so reduced thyroid, uh, anemia, um, heart disease, some sort of hidden malignancy, a number of conditions like that. And so you, you talked about uh, doing some testing, but of course before we get to that stage, it's really important to take a thorough history from the patient. And um, I was taught at medical school, and I think it's still true, that 80% of the diagnosis will come from taking the history. And so taking a very careful history, doing a, uh, a proper review of all the, all the systems, a systems review we call that, um, will unmask some of, the, some of the symptoms that perhaps the patient might, might not volunteer because they might not think they're important or they might not even have thought about them. Um, and then after that comes examination. Now there's often nothing to find on examination of patients with hemochromatosis, um, but certainly examination would look for other causes of tiredness and perhaps joint pain, uh, which would be a fairly thorough examination of really all the systems, um, cardiovascular, respiratory, lymph nodes, and checking vital signs, certainly things like um, uh, height and weight, because weight loss is another thing that uh, is, we call a red flag symptom. Having got to that stage, then probably if we can't find any particular clues, then some investigations would go ahead and typically we'd do things like a complete blood picture, uh, we'd look at a thyroid function, I mentioned that before, we would look at um, electrolytes, liver and kidney function and those sort of things. And then we may well go on to do an iron study because uh, iron deficiency is probably more common than hemochromatosis and will present um, uh, before the patient becomes anemic and so they can have a normal blood count. Um, obviously in, in um, hemochromatosis you've got a raised red cell count if it's more advanced uh, or rather a reduced red cell count which you get in anemia. Um, so a, an iron study is a fairly reasonable first line test um, in that sort of circumstance. A genetic condition, like any chronic condition, is going to cause some concerns. And when the diagnosis is initially made, the patient would go through uh, a process much like a grief process. They've lost something, which is their health, and there is initially some, some denial of it, there's initially some anger often, um, and eventually the other process is coming through to acceptance. And our job as GPs is to help our patients through that process and help understand why there might be some resistance to initial treatment um, because that's a normal part of, uh, of accepting of a, uh, of a new condition. Um, genetic conditions have a particular um, nuance to them because uh, it can affect the families, other family members as well. And particularly if people often diagnosed in middle age have already had children of their own, uh, and so if they have hemochromatosis, uh, their, part, their children are going to have a, um, uh, a likelihood of being a carrier and they may even have the disease depending on the status of, of the, of the um, other partner. And nobody likes the thought of passing on a condition to their children. So it's an extra layer in terms of the acceptance of that sort of condition. And part of our job as GPs is to help our patients understand that, um, to give them enough information and enough time to absorb that information. It sometimes takes two or three visits to, to go through it all. And often in that sort of circumstance, we would, uh, as GPs, meet with other members of the family. So the spouse, typically, or partner, uh, would come in to have a discussion with the index patient. If patients are symptomatic, they're much more likely to go for treatment than if they're not symptomatic. Mind you, if patients aren't symptomatic, it's unlikely they'll present unless they are presenting because a family member has been diagnosed. Um, one of the interesting things about this condition is it's the only condition that I know of where treatment of the patient actually helps other patients because treatment of the patient being venous section, uh, that blood can then be used as a blood donation for somebody else who might need it. Our patients uh, 
like to help other people. As humans, we like to help other people. Um, it's one of the reasons I'm a doctor, I like to help other people. And so a lot of people get um, almost a bit of a, um, a kick out of being the treatment of their hemochromatosis, being able to help somebody else. So I think it's one of the conditions where compliance is actually much easier than perhaps trying to get somebody to take insulin daily and check their blood sugars for insulin-dependent diabetes, for instance. Look, I think the reaction that people have is as variable as people are. Um, some people uh, are quite relieved that there's actually a cause for their symptoms. Um, oftentimes people will come in with the symptoms that I've talked about uh, we take a thorough history, we do a proper examination, we do some investigations and can't find anything. Um, and, uh, and those people also, some of them are disappointed we haven't found anything, some of them are quite relieved not to have found anything. And we often then talk about lifestyle issues uh, and other things like that because there are often issues in people's lives, um, uh, personal issues, family issues, work-related issues, uh, lack of fitness, too much alcohol, all sorts of things which may contribute to their presenting symptoms. There's a push from the Hemochromatosis Association to work with the various um, uh, PHN, primary health networks, in the various states to develop, help develop these pathways for the, each of the state health departments. And uh, they're already underway in Victoria, but the South Australian one is still in, in, uh, in development. So information is uh, now, these days, I think, readily available. We have access uh, through the Hemochromatosis Association website, for example. Uh, there are other sources, already sources of um, information. Um, there are some guidelines from a UK site called NICE, uh, which is a, um, a site where patient information can be readily found. Um, our clinical software often has uh, patient information sheets about a number of conditions. And I think, as with any chronic condition, it's really important to, to give some written information to the patient because um, experience has shown that patients will probably remember about 30% of what we say to them, which means that 70% of what we say to them they forget by the time they leave. And all they've really heard when they leave is, I've got a chronic condition, it can be treated, I might pass it on to my kids. And they'll come over, those three messages and the other seven messages are, are lost. So giving something in writing and then again seeing them uh, subsequently with the other with their partner is often a good way to reinforce those messages. It depends a lot on the experience for the GP and the confidence of the GP. In this sort of circumstance uh, would probably get a second opinion from a specialist just in terms of um, developing a plan for the patient. Um, once the iron levels are at a reasonable level then it's a three monthly venesection and they don't really, patients don't really need ongoing specialist care providing they haven't developed complications, particularly liver complications. Um, and it's a bit tricky with hemochromatosis to choose which sort of specialist. If there are complications it would probably go to the specialist relating to that condition. So if it's a liver complication, if they've already got cirrhosis or something else then it would be a, a gastroenterologist with an interest in, uh, in liver. If it happened to be heart related, it would be a cardiologist. If it happened to be joint related, it might be a rheumatologist. Often reducing the iron overload, bringing the iron levels back to normal, will allow most of the symptoms to abate. Both of them. <laughs> At the moment, I only have two patients who I know have hemochromatosis, um, and they uh, both are, are very compliant. That's a very good point. Uh, often there's delayed diagnosis uh, with this condition, um, and that's sometimes because patient, the symptoms are fairly uh, non-specific and and somewhat vague. So it's quite possible that patients um, will present late. But I think it's um, uh, important for us as GPs to make sure that we assess our patients thoroughly. If we go through the steps I outlined before, it's likely that we'll we'll turn out the diagnosis. Um, but it's like a lot of conditions with um, fairly non-specific uh, symptoms, they often take a while to, uh, to actually get the diagnosis um, correctly and accurately. It often comes down to exploring the reasons as to why the patient isn't compliant. 
And uh, there might be all sorts of reasons for that. It might be needle phobia, uh, it might, in which case we could address that. It might be that they don't prioritise this illness very highly. Um, maybe they've become asymptomatic, started presenting with symptoms, become asymptomatic, and they might form the view, well, if I'm feeling fine, why should I have any treatment? Uh, and then because they'd be aware that they can always come back and have some further treatment later on. Um, so exploring the reasons behind it, um, and which again goes back to patient assessment and taking a proper history. Sometimes the reasons can be readily addressed and sometimes they're um, reasons based on much more firmly held beliefs, even if the beliefs don't quite fit with the medical model and the scientific uh, evidence behind the diagnosis and the treatment. Um, and sometimes people just don't really think it's very important. And so part of that then becomes about patient education, um, making patients aware of what the recommendations are, what the current guidelines say, um, and also uh, there's a bit of a stick approach as well, so pointing out the consequences of uh, not complying with the medication. Because, once, uh, because iron overload can cause problems that may become irreversible. And I think when patients hear that sort of message, um, combination of carrot and stick, if you like, uh, they're often fairly, um, are much more likely to be compliant. Um, again, it's a good time to involve the rest of the family or the, the partner in particular, uh, if they have a partner, to, to, um, because often the, um, the, part, the person with the condition may not have even discussed it with their partner to say why, you know, what, why they're not going to have their three-monthly venous section anymore. It's important for GPs to be aware of their condition. And I think there is a lot more awareness now than there was certainly when I started um, uh, in medicine. And I think one of the things that's made the huge difference is the genetic studies that can be done. Um, and that's, those gene tests have been around for a bit over 20 years now. So I think um, awareness of the possibility, um, assessing our patients thoroughly, taking a proper history, doing a proper examination, doing appropriate investigations, um, getting some help from somebody else if we're not quite sure, um, and that might be one of our colleagues in our own practice or it might be a, a non-GP specialist colleague. Um, and the other thing that's really important, of course, is testing family members because, which would be siblings and offspring of the index case, um, because that's a, another very good way of picking up uh, this condition before it becomes symptomatic. I think probably once somebody's got into an aged care facility, um, it means they're so um, uh, frail, elderly, have other comorbidities, that making a diagnosis of hereditary hemochromatosis is probably less important than it might have been. Not to say that we don't care for the health of our elderly, frail patients, but I think it goes back to the, to the original question about how do you make the diagnosis. So if they complained of, um, of tiredness and, and joint pains, um, there were lots of other causes for patients in nursing homes to have those symptoms, but it would be worthwhile going through the usual routine I said before, taking the history, seeing if there are other clues about hereditary hemochromatosis, uh, and doing the appropriate investigation, which in the first instance is iron studies, particularly ferritin. It depends a bit on where the iron overload occurs. So if, for instance, uh, there is um, extra iron in the heart, um, then patients may well present with cardiac or respiratory symptoms such as shortness of breath, chest pain perhaps. Um, and in the workup of patients with those conditions, we may be thinking this is, is heart related, may do things like chest x-rays and echocardiograms initially, but um, uh, we still need to think uh, broadly about what else might be uh, causing the symptoms. There is a temptation, of course, and I guess particularly in the very elderly patients, to treat the symptoms rather than necessarily look too hard for the underlying cause. But um, a wise geriatrician once told me that for the elderly patients, we should be very aggressive in terms of diagnosis, but not necessarily aggressive in terms of treatment, because that then does help uh, uh, lead to accurate information about prognosis. Um, where else might it happen? Well, I guess uh, if you get uh, iron overload in the liver, uh, that can cause symptoms related to reduced liver function. It may present with um, jaundice uh, in the extreme case. And again, the 
uh, appropriate uh, blood tests for the liver function would be abnormal or deranged and further investigation of the liver using ultrasound or other techniques like that may well uh, reveal uh, some liver damage. The awareness is increasing. Certainly when I um, first graduated, it's a condition I'd read about in medical school but hadn't really ever made the diagnosis. I think the reason for the increase in awareness, uh, certainly for me, is twofold. Firstly, because I've seen some cases come through the exam about this and that's raised my awareness. Um, and as I mentioned before, there's now gene testing and so we can be much more certain about the diagnosis uh, or confirm the diagnosis um, with much more certainty than we could before the gene test was available. And I think that came out about 20 years ago. I think it was the late 90s. There is a variety of ways that GPs um, educate. Uh, most of our education is self-directed. And one of the things that would happen would be if we happened to make a diagnosis of hemochromatosis in our patients, or if somebody else made a diagnosis in one of our patients for us, that may well lead to a reflection on, on hemochromatosis and upskilling in that particular area. The problem is if we only see somebody every five or 10 years presenting with this condition, it's not gonna be something that we're going to be doing um, a lot of study on every week. The College of GPs has a number of educational um, activities and, and arms. We have a, a monthly um, journal and there are occasionally articles about hemochromatosis in that journal. I think the last one was a few years ago. Um, we have a number of educational activities um, such as the Czech program and GP learning uh, and they have uh, articles about hemochromatosis or, or um, activities about hemochromatosis from time to time. Um, I mentioned the College of GPs exam and for people like myself for examiners, if there's a case of hemochromatosis, um, then that's always a, uh, a good reminder of how patients can present. And so it then raises the awareness of hemochromatosis as a possible cause of patient symptoms. Uh, and it's a slight misunderstanding, there's not actually a specific uh, restriction on ordering iron studies. Um, with any item in the Medicare schedule uh, or any service that a doctor provides, it has to be clinically relevant. That is necessary for the appropriate treatment of the patient to whom it is rendered. Um, the restriction around uh, this condition is on the gene testing. So the gene testing can only be rebated by Medicare if the patient has appropriate symptoms and they have uh, uh, altered iron studies. So they have a, a, a raised ferritin and a raised uh, ferritin saturation, transferrin saturation. Um, and uh, the other condition that you can do it is for family, for testing for family members. Not uncommon to have a slight misunderstanding about how the Medicare system can work, but that's um, the explanation of that.